Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Christian Church, Denton. It is Sunday, uh, January 23rd. Happy birthday, Mom. <laughs> um, we are worshiping in our sanctuary today, and uh, some of us are worshiping in our sanctuary today. Some are worshiping online. Good morning, all who are joining us this morning, and hello to all that are joining us at some other time. We are pleased to be able to offer worship at, in, a, in a manner that whatever time works best during this sort of chaotic time, when sometimes we don't know whether it's day or night or Sunday or Wednesday, you can take time for worship and worship with us and hear good news together. Uh, so may you be blessed to continue blessing others as we seek to be the people of good news. So welcome to friends, welcome to visitors, welcome one and all. You will notice that we are wearing masks because we love each other and we love singing and we want to take care of each other. So thank you all for helping with that. Um, the ministries of the church continue, many of them online. Uh, so if you want to find out more about the church and our activities, a lot of that is listed on our website, fccdenton.org. There, you can also sign up for our newsletter, and that has even more details about us. So, for instance, um, the Disciples Women meet on Tuesday evenings. There's a Wednesday night book study. Uh, Brian McLaren's We Make the Road by Walking. Uh, the Envision community will be meeting this evening uh, at 5 o'clock. So that, again, also has an online component to it. And so, if you want to find out more about us, just check in or ask or call, because uh, we are a faith community that is seeking deeper relationships with God and each other. We envision community as a place where all of God's gifts and talents are welcomed and honored, every tongue, race, culture, identity, and gender. One last announcement, as we've been going through stuff here, we found some uh, cookbooks that were put together a few years back. There are some on uh, the table out in the Narthex, the entryway of the church. And so if you would like some extra recipes and a collection of favorite recipes from folks in the church, pick up one and take it home. I am looking forward to something new to make. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's like, what are we having for supper? Mm, let's try something different. So there's a gift as well. So, at this point, if there's no other announcements, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. The Lord be with you. Called as partners in Christ's service, called to ministries of grace, we respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we walk by art of sharing, side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. Christ example, Christ inspiring, Christ clear call to work and worth. Help us follow, never faltering, reconciling for God earth. Men and women, richer, poorer, all God's people, young and old, bringing human skills together, gracious gifts from God. God unfold as new patterns for Christ's mission in a small or global sense. Help us bear each other's burdens, breaking down each wall or fence. Words of comfort, words of vision, words of talent said with care. Bring new power and strength for action. Make us colleagues free and fair. So God grant us for tomorrow ways to order human life that surround each person. 
distress and sorrow, with heart come that conquer strife. Make us partners in our living, our compassion to increase. Messengers of faith, us giving hope and comfort and peace. Please pray with me. On this day, we come together to make sense of our lives. We look to your word, O oh God, as a source of understanding. Revive our souls that our hearts may rejoice in your presence. Cleanse and enlighten us with your truth. Liberate us from self-imposed limitations. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. We lift up your prayers together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. It is time for children's message. I hope everybody is ready. Today we are going to run a relay race. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to tell you to wear your sweats and comes all stretched out. The whole church is on the same team, including those of you watching from home. The idea is to work together to make our way around the outside of the church building in a really fast time. Oh, maybe we should have practiced. Now, I have some kind of strange rules for our race. The first and most important one is that no one can win unless we all win. To make it a little more interesting, I've got some roadblocks for us. Now, Kristen, you're gonna be the team captain, and these are gonna be your foggy old sunglasses so that you can't see where to lead us. Okay. And since she can't see to lead us, we're going to have Linda holler out. Oh. If I just take off the glasses, I will be able to see it. See any? Oh, well, there you go. There's more than one way to skin a cat. So, since Kristen can't see, Linda is going to holler out the directions. The only problem is Linda has laryngitis. So, we can't hear her when she yells. And those of us that might be able to hear her, well, we're going to have these earphones on. We're going to be listening to music, so we couldn't hear her anyway. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, maybe Mark could use his hands, use his fingers to point us in the right direction. Only thing is, Mark is cold. He's got this big mitten on. Nobody can see his fingers pointing. Okay, is everybody ready? How do you think you're going to do? Are we going to make it? Well, the Bible tells us how we can make it and how we can do it. Let's see, there's a part in Corinthians that says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. And it goes on to tell us that each and every one of us have a very special gift that we can share. Sometimes in life, there's going to be roadblocks, sunglasses, earmuffs, gloves. 
but we are assured that we each have gifts. Kristen does have leadership skills, thank goodness. Linda can teach, and Mark can lead music. Each of you in this room has a special gift that you can share. Those of you that are home, we know that even though you're not here in the room with us, you're just as eager as we are to learn and pray and be together. We can do all these things. We can use our gifts together so that we can be a great church. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the gifts that you have given to each of us. Help us to use them to work together for the good of your church. And as always, help us to be the best kids we can be. Amen. Please pray with me during our prayer for illumination. Spirit of God, who inspired the scriptures and enlivens meaning in our day, open our eyes to the gifts you have entrusted to each one of us and who us how to and how we work together to realize your purpose in our midst. We long to live in a world where mutual caring and support replace competition and violence. Help us to honor one another's gifts and strive for the greatest of all gifts, the embodiment of your love. Amen. Okay, we have scripture reading now. Uh, we have two scriptures. The first one is Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10. And Nehemiah was the Persian-appointed governor responsible for resettling the Jewish people who had been allowed to return to Jerusalem after half a century of exile in Babylonia in the 6th century B.C. The event recorded in today's lesson is the first public reading of the Mosaic covenant in Jerusalem in about 50 years as they rebuild a shattered faith community. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive, attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and, and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31a. For just as the body is one and has many members, 
and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that seem to be weak are indispensable, and those nonetheless of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts.
let your servants fall in freedom. May your mercy know and live. We come to a time so important in our church, a time for prayer. Let us pray together. Holy God, we give thanks that we can gather, that some of that gathering can be in person, and we give thanks for the gifts of technology that we can gather remotely as well. Gifts that sometimes are hard to understand, but Lord, we give thanks for your mystery and for those with a variety of gifts that help us to gather together. In times of crisis, we tend to remember small things that are of value, seemingly small things like that you call us to work together, a diverse people, people who have different points of view, who have different gifts, and yet together you do amazing things. And so we give thanks for people who know technology. We give thanks for people who teach ten children. We give thanks for people who know so much about the body and care for it, whether they be nurses or doctors, technicians, assistants. We give thanks for people who know our history and remember it and keep it vibrant. We give thanks for people who work in this day, keeping things organized, clean, stocked, and so many other current tasks of the day. We give thanks for visionaries, researchers, prophets of our day, who seek your wisdom study patterns and speak words of wisdom on how you guide us. There are so many other industries. Let us take a moment to lift up those that are on your heart. Lord, hear our prayer. And so we ask that you help us to hear your voice still speaking to us within community and individually. That we may feel connected, that we may feel centered that we may know that we are loved by you and that you are still with us, encouraging us to live our best self and encouraging us to be people of grace and love, that we may still be a light to the community, to our city, our state, our nation, and beyond. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. In 
the midst of new dimensions in the face of changing ways. Who will lead the pilgrim peoples wandering in their separate ways? God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We your people are the journey now and evermore. Through the flood of starving peoples, warring frowns of this despair, who will lift the olive branches? Who will light the flame of care? God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We, your people, are the journey now and evermore. the highest heavens holding worlds at our command we are yet a desert people searching for the promised land god of rainbow fiery pillar leading where the eagles soar we your people are the journey now and evermore. Should the threats of dire predictions cause us to withdraw in pain, may your blazing phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. God, the rainbow fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We, your people, are the journey now and Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to Luke. It's in chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. It is a story that talks about the beginning of Jesus' ministry, where he is in his, comes to his hometown and is announcing what his ministry will be like. In the church, we might say this is, in a sense, part of his mission and vision statement. So listen for the word of God, for the people of God. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me with, to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God add God's blessing upon the reading of this word. So like many, I have been reflecting on pandemic experiences, about what we've been doing during this time, what uh, has gone on in the past, because in March, it will be almost two years. March of 2020, the congregation that I was serving in the middle of the month moved to complete to be working completely online. And I was able to shift 
to working at home. And I realize that I have been so fortunate to have work, to have family, uh, to live with a loving husband. And I was even able during part of that time to help care for a lovely father-in-law uh, who spent time in my home. And he and I would laugh about him coming to visit for two weeks and staying for nine months. And while we have different points of view on some things, uh, my father-in-law and, father and I always try to have good humor and we enjoy each other a lot. Of course, chocolate cake always helps. We were on the same page all the way around, though, of that we should try to keep safe and preserve life. So that, that and a lot of chocolate cake was good. So being on the same page, this is sort of an important concept for this time, especially when you're caring for uh, someone in their mid-90s. Now, as a casual musician, being on the same page is really important. I mean, almost everyone in my family has played some sort of instrument or been in some sort of choir. Even the one, oh yeah, my husband, who has no training in music, he joined a bell choir at one point, so he could at least play two notes. So, you know, he's really enjoyed that. So whether you play a flute or a tuba, a violin or a banjo, a beginner or an expert, everything goes much better when you're at least on the same page of music. Then you can play well together. So as we share information, we also share emotion. And some of us, of course, in our family, are deeply involved in faith. Some, not so much. But we learn how to play well together. And we can stay on the same page. And simple things become important. So about three months into the pandemic, a daughter and I planned to meet up for a short visit. And we talked protocol so that we would be on the same page. And we planned for that first hug that we had had for several months. And yes, we cried. But they were not bad tears. I mean, my husband said, why are you crying? It's happy tears. It's joyful tears. It's that, the, that strong emotion of you know, the separation, the planning, the joyful event. So yes, it was an event to be remembered. When you've missed and longed for a simple thing like, like hugs, they become special. And these and other seemingly everyday occurrences become special and worth planning for, worth getting on that same page so everything plays out well. See, the folks in our reading from Nehemiah have missed out on a simple act of worship and hearing scripture together. And we can relate to that today, can't we? So they are experiencing strong emotion during a seemingly simple event of gathering together in the town square, at the water gate, we're told, and, but they're, they're being quite emotional. And I don't think it was just the length of the service. That might have keyed in if you go back and see how many hours this was taking. But part of it was the history before that. See, there had been prosperity under King David and his successor Solomon, and then the Jewish kingdom of 10 tribes had split in two, and that put them weaker, and then they were picked off by stronger nations, especially Assyria and its successor Babylon. So about 586 BC, most of the Jews have been exported to Babylon, or deported, I should say, where they lived in exile for about 50 years. So they were just scattered out for about 50 years. And then this Persian king Cyrus, he comes into power, and he sends the dispersed people back to Jerusalem. He said, you can go home, and you can rebuild the temple. So they're returning, they're trying to rebuild the walls of the city, and they have plans to rebuild the temple, but there's a problem in that 50 years have passed, and many of these returning people, well, they're Jewish by birth, but they have little understanding of what the faith entails, what God wants from them, 
and why many have grown up speaking Arabic, and the governor, Nehemiah, and the scribe and priest, Ezra, well, they begin this town meeting, they're reading scripture, but they also have people that are walking through the crowd. And these are named people. But I was very kind to Kate, and we didn't read all the names, because they are really long, different sounding names. I'm, they're great names, they should be remembered. But, but they read, there were people reading, and there was people wandering around among that were helping translate. And this was important because Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages, and some things sound similar and might even have similar meaning, meanings, but it might be, do I get this right, or is it a little bit different? So, it's that we, so there's people trying to explain this. We're told they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people could understand the reading. So this is important. There's still those times when we need to look a little closer and say, are we understanding this well? Because we need to know that we're hearing it right, that we're understanding it right, and that, yes, yeah, sometimes there will be an emotional response too, especially when you haven't been able to gather and now you not only get to gather, but you hear these stories of God. You hear these instructions. And we're told that the, people, that, that the crowd was, said, was told to be happy, to go feast. This is good news. So, not only are we hearing about this event, but we're also hearing about the people that are trying to make sure that folks understand. Language and words are important. It's still important today. You know, they say whenever you read a book about the Bible, you understand, you find out probably more about the author or as much about the author as you do about the Bible. And, you know, even like a preacher, you find out something about the preacher when she's preaching to the people. We end up sharing parts of ourselves as we talk about language. If you read you understand that Jesus is also trying to share things about himself, that the Apostle Paul, we find out a little bit about who he is by how he talks to the congregations he has worked with. And Paul was a powerful preacher, and he is staying in touch with churches that he has worked with in the past. And he's heard that this church in Corinth is struggling, is having arguments about who's the most important, who's the most gifted, and he wants to get them to be on the same page, to play well together, to say all these different gifts are important, like Charlotte was explaining so well to us. Now, some people in church growth will say, well, you have to have everybody thinking the same way, and that way you'll grow a big church. And, well... I think the Apostle Paul would disagree with that. He's sort of saying, if you gather all the toes together, you'll have a toe church, but, well, who's going to do the heavy lifting? And if you gather all the arms together, you may get a lot of stuff done, but are you going to be a little bit off balance because there's no toes keeping you sort of balanced together? It's great to hang out with people that are like-minded and think just the way that you do. But you know what? It's also great to be in a diverse community where we can be in conversation and say, oh, you know what? I hadn't thought of it that way before. Cookie cutter marketing may work great for some of the big brand stores and restaurants and coffee shops, but that's not what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to have diversity. And yes, sometimes it's a little uncomfortable when we get into conversation and say, now what was that again? And that's where we need that translation and word, to have words together and try and understand where we're coming from and where we're going. We shouldn't let that concept of comfort limit our vision and perception of what church is to be. Because as comfortable as we are together, and as well as we play together, there are people who don't know, who genuinely don't know 
what a warm and welcoming place church can be. And so it's going to take each one of us sharing that message with someone else saying, this is a great place to be. A church that welcomes all to the Lord's table, that encourages participation without judgment. Yes, diversity is, takes a little bit of shifting here and there, but every member has ministry to do. See, Jesus is talking about this in a sense when he is challenging us to encourage a diverse group of people in the church. See, Jesus has returned to Galilee after being going out a bit. He's been filled with the Spirit, and he's announcing his ministry. And he casts this vision where people who are in need are being taken care of. It's these foundation stones upon which he builds his ministry. He stands in his hometown synagogue, reads the prophecy of Isaiah that proclaims, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus uses this to proclaim and explain his mission and what he's all about. He shared something about where he's going in a way that is radical and startling to the people there, about bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release, all these things. And these are challenging words. In fact, next week, we're going to continue this story and see how it plays out and that some of the people from even his hometown church are having problems with this picture of extravagant love and grace, but that's next week. <laughs> Today, we're going to engage this message of what it means to say we should be able to get along with, to help and have people help us who are poor or captive or blind or oppressed, what it means to be with people who are even different than us. Jesus uses his own self, in a sense, to interpret scripture, for he is the word made flesh. He explains this scripture in a bold way, saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Fulfilled. Well, that's good, because that, doesn't that mean that it's done? And it was done back then? Well, it doesn't mean that there's nothing else to do. Because see, again, to look deeper into that language, in the language that this was written in, in Koine Greek, there, this word fulfilled is in a tense that we really don't work with much in English. It's called the perfect tense. And those verbs don't translate well. They say, well, it has been completed it in the past, but it affects the present, and it could possibly even have reverberations into the future. So it, it sort of implies that we need to keep working on this. There's still that fulfilling work, that fulfillment work to be done. Do you know there's people today that work in departments of fulfillment? Maybe that's what we are in a sense that spiritual fulfillment. This fulfillment is cast as a vision, not as an ending that stopped in the past, but rather one that keeps going for a living and active church. So we need to support each other in ways that fulfill and could care for people around us, knowing that we have friends, we have neighbors, there are folks around us that are feeling frustrated or even held captive, or that are struggling with oppression, that are blind to what's going on. We see glimpses in the stories that we share with one another where we can also see glimpses of where God has been walking with one another. And so we need to reach out to those who are around us, 
those outside the walls as well as inside the walls because, boy, today, who knows where there might be someone who needs to hear that message of good news, that God is here for you, that God loves you, no matter how oppressed or distant you feel. This proclamation that was heard a long time ago in a small town has very real implications and instructions for us today. It's a story about liberation that has no bounds, and it's supposed to continue to be lived out. We are supposed to be spreading this generous good news. Spreading that good news. This is our divine challenge, to be the people who follow Jesus as he leads us to be the people who care for the poor, feed the hungry, tend to the sick, comfort those who mourn, engage in strong emotions, not being fearful of them, welcome the outcast, because that's what we do to play well together. This is a church that believes those things are important, that calls upon people who are isolated or are ill, who visits those in the hospital. This is a church that comforts those who mourn. This is a place that welcomes those who are different. This is God's will, and this is God's way that we are seeking to live out. As a theologian, Mark, Marcus Borg once wrote, God wills our liberation, our exodus from Egypt. God wills our reconciliation and our return from exile. God wills our enlightenment, our seeing. God wills our forgiveness, our release from sin and guilt. And God wills that we see ourselves as God's beloved. God wills our resurrection and our passage from death to life. And God wills good food and drink that satisfies our hunger and thirst. God wills comprehensively our well-being, not just for my well-being as an individual, but the well-being of all of us and all of creation. In short, God loves you. God wills our salvation, our healing here today. This is our charge, to be people who live out this mission and this ministry. That this is the place where we practice living into God's will, playing well with others, and even praying well with others. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I know one of the things that we miss is having dinner parties with lots of people together. And so one of the things that I'm looking forward to is this cookbook that I will get to bring home and see the new recipes and the people who have submitted recipes, some that I know, some that I've only heard their names from the past. But that food and those tastes carry on, do they not? Through the generations. How many people have a recipe that was written down by someone you love that is still in a recipe book or box? And so we are invited to this table, knowing that there were people around the table. We know about Jesus and the disciples, but there were other people there too, because someone cooked the meal. And those someones probably had some children around and things like that. So this is a table of plenty, of abundance, that have fed, this table has fed people for generations. And this is not just the table of First Christian Church, this is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we remember here that table gatherings are important. For important conversations and passing on important promises and wisdom. And so it is at this table that we remember that at a time, a time that was difficult, on the night of his betrayal even, Jesus gathered with his disciples. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to them saying, take Eat from this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And in like manner, he did take the cup, he filled it, he blessed it, he gave it to them saying, take, drink of this, all of you. This is my life's blood poured out for you and for many. Drink from it, all of you, each time you gather, and remember me. For when we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus until he comes again. Let us pray. O oh, omnipotent God, we have faith in you. When we don't seem to know where to turn or who to listen to, we know that you are our center, our core being, and that gives us great comfort. You knew that we would fail each other and make many mistakes, but in your wisdom you made provision for us in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are able to remember your love for us as we partake of the emblems at this table. Lord, we ask that these symbols of your Son's broken body and blood shed for our sins give us strength to sustain us this week until we can renew ourselves. In your name, we ask these things of you. Amen. And so, my friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. As it is passed to you, you will find that there are two cups that are passed to you. One has bread, and one has the fruit of the vine. My friends, all is ready.
So we have gathered. We have been hungry and have been fed. We have gathered and we are glad. And so we give thanks that we have been fed on God's body and God's word. And we give thanks for that in prayer. We also want to give thanks for those who give, who give and support this mission and this ministry that we can keep spreading this good news, that we can keep this a good, safe place of gathering. And so let us pray in thanksgiving. God, we give thanks that you are with us, that you have fed us, that you have fed us so that we have may, may have strength and courage to continue to serve you and others. We give thanks for the gifts that have been given and offer your blessings upon them that they may be multiplied, that we may be able to continue to do your good work. Continue to guide us and strengthen us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, friends, if you have more questions about what it means to be part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, what it means to be part of First Christian Church Denton, please do not hesitate to contact me to ask myself or one of the elders like Kate or others that are among us, for we would be happy to share with you why it is, has been a delightful and blessed thing to be a part of a church community, a faith community. So let us consider that as we sing our closing hymn, Lord, You Give the Great Commission.
And so as our worship comes to an end, our service continues. So we are charged to go out and serve others. May the God of creation bless you with so much diversity. May the Spirit enliven us with more understanding than we imagined. And may Christ continue to walk with us guiding us, leading us, encouraging us to that future which is already planned for good. Amen. <laughs>